acknowledge our traditional landowners. So today I come to you from Yangmo land, which is part of the Bundjalung nation of the Bundjalung language group, which is in Northern New South Wales. I wish to acknowledge over 65,000 years of custodianship of this land and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I honor the spirit and wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia. I will strengthen community with learning, culture and spirituality that they impart and ensure that together we continue to connect and grow as one. The Yader Institute acknowledges that the lands of Australia were never ceded and commits to ongoing truth telling, awareness and reconciliation. Okay, so this morning, um, I just would like to run through some participation reminders. Anything shared will be at your own discretion and we are recording this morning's session. Um, and some screenshots will be taken. If you choose not to have participate in a screenshot, I invite you to turn your camera off when we're at that point. Please respect others' privacy by not taking personal recordings or screenshots of the event. And please put yourself on mute if you're not talking to reduce background noise. Feel free to ask questions at any time. We're going to start with a check-in question um, before, we, before I introduce our storyteller this morning. And um, after she's shared her story with us, I invite you to use your sticky notes on our mural board and put up some ideas, some thoughts, some questions, whatever comes to mind that you feel the need to share. And we'll, then we'll go into a World Cafe process and dig a bit deeper into some questions. Okay, so, this morning, I thought I might ask, what is your personal weather status? Are you cloudy, foggy? Do you have sunny breaks? So I invite you to um, share verbally or you can pop some sticky notes on the mural or you can do a bit of both. Well, I might get started. Uh, it's Valmay here and I'm sitting on the... Uh, very cool banks of the Boulogne River out near St George, which is a, uh, a small country town um, out west of Queensland. We have had probably three weeks of 30 to 34 degree days, and this morning it's two degrees. So a um, bit, bit of a change in weather, which I think is uh, affecting the whole state. Great. Thanks, Valmy. I'll pick up. Hi, I'm Julie from Gubby Gubby Land in uh, Sunshine Coast, Queensland. Um, I'll do my personal um, weather status today. That's how I. That's what I picked up. I was, yesterday I was definitely cloudy and foggy. And if there's any other ones that are like real hazy, that was me yesterday. It was a really big few days for me, and I. Um, I actually got a tick bite and was doing my, it was really, anyway, today I'm hoping for sunny breaks and sunshine and I'm feeling much more connected to the mother earth and yeah, feeling great today. No more foggy, cloudy days. Peace back. Hi everyone. I've got, um, I've got a number again. My name's Kate. <laughs> um, Yesterday, it was about eight degrees here, it reached a maximum of eight. Uh, I live on Anawan land in Armadale, New South Wales. Um, today, it's sunny and bright and blue skies everywhere and freezing cold again, <laughs> but improving on yesterday. Would you, are you able to put a sticky note on Kate or would you like some help with that? I, I got a bit tangled up doing that. Um, if all um, okay. I'll try again, but if you all lose, right. I'll come back again, so. All right, lovely, thank you. Hi, oh, is it, oh sorry, Nick. I'm, I'm another Kate, hi Kate. Hi. Um, <laughs> I come from Mother Realm Land and it's getting nicer here in Geelong. We've moved to Janjuk, which is right beside the beach. Um, and albeit freezing, the kids are all surfing, so. It's a great day. So, yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll pick up. Um, my name is Michaela. I'm coming to you from Batula Land, Queensland, Harvey Bay, 
area. Um, the sun is shining. I'm feeling a little bit um, cloudy, uh, foggy. I think it's because the wind was really hot yesterday and today the wind is really cold and and it's a full moon and I'm just all a bit disturbed. Um, so, um, but looking forward to sunny breaks, I get an, I'm going to get some acupuncture today. So it should be good. Peace back. Thanks, Mitch. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Jen Brown. I'm from New Jersey in the States. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely Tuesday evening here. Um, I think it's about, it would be about 23 degrees, your, your temperature here. So it's in the 70s, which is just absolutely beautiful because it was uh, in the 80s over the weekend and it was hot and humid and I got to watch a football game with 110,000 other people wow. for the first time in two years, which was fantastic. And we won, so it was even more exciting. Yeah. Um, but today it was really, really, I refer to it as delicious. It was low humidity, a nice breeze. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping this, this stretch of weather lasts for several weeks before it, uh, before it gets cold. I was at the uh, Penn State Auburn game, Kathleen, in, uh, in Happy Valley, so. Well, as a lifelong fan of the Alabama Crimson Tide, might I say, Great job, Penn State You're welcome. fans. <laughs> You're welcome. We did our best. <laughs> you seemed excited, so I assumed you weren't from Auburn. No. <laughs> because it would be impossible to be excited if you were from Auburn. It was really good game. Whatsoever. Um, so I'm Catherine Titus, and I'm in beautiful, sunny Spokane, Washington. And for quick access, if this helps anyone, I'm... Uh, maybe middle-aged, one never knows how long they'll live, a uh, person. And I have very pale skin, white, pale white skin, and um, long red hair that's in a ponytail. And I'm wearing glasses with a dark frame and a gray sweater. And um, maybe you'll get lucky and my micromanager Mimi will join us again today. And I am so grateful actually that it's actually, it was so hot all summer here, you know, like around the globe, it got so hot. And um, for a long period of time and fires and everything. And so just to have it be sunny, 74 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny and crisp mornings and crisp evenings is just like, hallelujah. So I'm happy to be here with all of you. Lovely. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, so for me, I'm feeling a bit like the weather today here, which is a bit cloudy and feels like it's a good day to curl up in bed, but I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Um, so, yeah, I'm hoping the sun breaks through at some point. <laughs> that would be really nice. So I'm going to invite um, our guest storyteller today, Val May Rose, to share her story with us today. Um, and we're going to be talking about building, uh, how do we build a bridge from service client to valued citizen um, and building expectation that people can and will shape their own future. So over to you, Val May. Thank you. It's interesting listening to that check-in. Um, I've been feeling for a while now that there's something stirring and it's not, it's not necessarily all good, but um, that things are stirring. And I've always believed that uh, that sort of tension and agitation is needed for some change. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think we're due for some change, you know, particularly with regard to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, so, for those of you who, who aren't here in Australia, are you familiar with the, the NDIS or that the NDIS uh, is our uh, disability service system, which has uh, been reformed in the last few years and was initially filled with very high promise. Um, and I think to be fair, we'd have to say that now it's not quite delivering on the promise, on some of the promises anyway, particularly around choice and control for people. 
So that's really where my story starts. Um, I have always been interested in why we, and when I say we, um, I mean those of us who have worked in the disability sector for a really long time, um, but have family, friends, um, and I guess a long-term investment in uh, people with disability and their families having a decent life. So I've always been interested in why we seem so invested collectively in keeping people's dreams small. And about 20 years ago, um, I used to be an occupational therapist. And, and at that time, I embarked on some postgrad study about what the barriers to visioning and dreaming were for women with an intellectual impairment in particular. Um, I never finished that study, but the uh, primary learning I got from that is that the support system around people, the support workers in particular, tended to be people who had very small expectations for their own future. Um, and often uh, on interview really had nobody in their own lives who uh, had inspired them. So no, you know, favorite aunt or grandma or grade three teacher or anyone really in their lives who had uh, planted the seed that absolutely anything is possible. Um, and they were, also people who didn't rate dreaming or even thinking about the future very highly, which was both disturbing because it was so all pervasive, um, but I found it, it was also exciting because it meant that you could, um, you know, potentially if you change the conditions in which people were being supported, then, you know, perhaps you could open up the future a whole lot more. So I got very excited at that, but um, like everyone, I got very busy and it wasn't until just a few years ago that I went back and actually did my master's and um, I looked specifically at the relationship between vulnerability and the power to shape one's own future. Um, and I mean the very broadest definition of, of vulnerability. I just looked at, um, and I guess there's absolutely, like most study, there's, there's nothing new that comes out of it, but I I certainly learned with some conviction that power and vulnerability can and do coexist often uh, and everywhere, but that it's contextual. So um, one of my best mates, one of the most powerful advocates that I know um, is, is a fellow with quadriplegia. And he has always said that it doesn't matter what power he has in any other context the minute he walks through the doors of a hospital he feels utterly hopelessly powerless um, and I guess that's the the territory uh, I want us to dwell in a bit today um, so there are lots of reasons why people find it challenging to dream as you know um, an unexpected life or an unexpected change in circumstances certainly can leave us with low expectations for the future. Living with people um, or being in an environment where dreams are considered frivolous, unattainable, or even a waste of time will leave us with very low expectations for the future. Um, life experience itself can teach us that the future is closed or at the very least constrained and beyond our power to shape. Now, this I think is what we've been experiencing in the NDIS where this glimmer of hope that maybe the future would move from being closed to at least open and with a few more options, um, it just feels like that window is closing for us. And I think it's really important that we start to get very deliberate about keeping it open. So, um, I've started to work hard both in developing resources and just talking to people um, about making sure that expectations stay high. Uh, so the target of these um, resources and, and just conversation really has been for those people themselves who um, want to keep their future open or for those people who... Um, who really want to understand better for the people that they care about how to keep the future open rather than letting, letting that window close. So I think we, we 
um, probably all in all acknowledge that dreaming and turning those dreams into reality don't just happen. Um, and it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, it requires a physical and social environment that allows dreams to emerge. You know, the conditions um, where dreams can emerge. Um, it also needs the capacity um, to imagine. And again, that's something that doesn't happen by accident. And it's not that some people are born with it and some aren't. It's something that we need to uh, build skill and confidence in. So that ability to generate mental images of a, of a range of possible futures, um, you know, on the basis that if you can't imagine something, you can't create it. It also requires an ability to recognise and deal with the limiting, uh, limiting mental models, I guess, the beliefs, the assumptions, the worldviews, the, you know, the narrative, the story, um, both individually and collectively. Um, and so the ability to recognise and handle some of those limiting beliefs, but also um, takes a bit of skill to, to even to shift from what you want um, into that actually happening in practice. So in other words, um, and, and this was the focus of my study, it requires the ability to deconstruct your current reality in order to reconstruct to something, uh, reconstruct um, the reality that you'd prefer. So I know there's lots of tools and I'm sure, you know, for those of you who are uh, participating at the moment, um, I'll assume that you've got a working knowledge of the whole range of um, very practical tools and sets of guidelines and so on for helping people, um, you know, find their, their, their view of or their vision for a decent life. Um, Val, may I've got your slides ready whenever you want them. Just oh, let yeah. me know. I'm probably yep. up to slide three. Oh, okay. <laughs> they can, right, they can stay on the, you know, they can stay with it. They're not, that's it. Do you want me to? Oh, okay. oh, that's all right. Just tell me which, um, you know, when to progress. We're on slide three. Yeah. So for those of you listening. Can I, can I see slide, slide two before we skip one, just for 30 seconds? I'm keen. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yep. So, so we're primarily talking about um, the need to actually be deliberate about creating the conditions for dreams to emerge, um, building some fairly specific skills and confidence in using those skills that dreaming doesn't just happen. Um, and then finishing up with shaping, you know, taste testing, turning those dreams into reality. And having um, both in, in my, you know, day-to-day -day practice and in study, I'm of the view that um, all of the, uh, you know, the negativity around people's capacity to dream, I just don't buy it anymore. You know, I used to, um, and I think... Um, we're, we're just not approaching it. You know, I think we need to find some new ways of approaching it. And I've started with the very basic. I think tools are really important, and, but I, I don't believe anymore that it's anything to do with the individual. It's that we haven't yet created the conditions where people can dream um, and can turn those dreams into reality. Um, and certainly what we see in the service system here is that there's a lot of um, anticipatory, you know, and it's not just about managing risk for people, it's about deliberately lowering expectations and not just of the people that we support and care about, but the people who are doing the supporting. Balme, just let me know when you want to move on those slides. Which number is that? Is that two? We go on? Okay, if we go on to three. Okay, so in terms of creating the conditions uh, for dreams to emerge, I think it starts at being able to daydream, you know, having places in your life that you love being, whether it's, you know, grandma's kitchen or uh, the cafe at the local library or wherever it is that you spend more time in those places that you walk away from feeling more whole. 
and also uh, that you start to build your discernment about positive and negative, you know, your, your discernment about who the people and places and events are that uh, give you energy and those that drain energy. And that you actually start, and this may take a good while, you, you start quite deliberately spending more time with those people who fill you with energy and positivity um, and stay, a place, stay away from those places. Um, then moving on to the next step, which is actually being able to reflect and reflect. So being discerning about what fills you with energy and what drains you, but also um, being able to reflect on events recent and past and actually start to make some decisions about which of those events would I want to carry into the future with me and which am I quite happy to leave in the past. So you get used to and and in working with people to start to think about the last few days, the last week, over the last month or even this year, you know, cast your attention over the events and people and places you've been and think about which of those gave you the greatest sense of positivity for the future and which tended to make you feel small or even sad. It's something that um, it does take some practice and it's useful to actually do it with the person. So you're teaching it as a skill and you're actually making time in, in, in the day to do that. You know, whether that's associated with doing some journaling or you know, taking some photos or whatever, but to build that in as a daily practice. So moving on to slide four. Oh, that's all right. That's where we are. Um, so I always include um, some work with uh, family or support workers with regard to having respect for the role of supporting somebody to dream because it's not, it's not a job. It's actually a real privilege to be in a position of supporting someone to dream. And so you've got to make sure you're a good choice because not everybody is a good choice depending on your own, um, I guess, worldview and life experience. So I usually, um, you know, I ask people whether they are someone who have low expectations for their own future if, and they often they'll um, label that as being realistic about their future, then perhaps they're not the best choice um, of person if they have limiting beliefs about what's possible for people with disability uh, then perhaps they're not the best choice of person which is totally fine um, but let's do the work on finding a person who um, or supporting the, the individual to find a person who's going to be a good match and rarely is there not somebody who makes people feel bigger than they usually feel I've got uh, you know a couple of worksheets and so on that I could um, upload but I generally ask questions or, or pose reflection questions such as am I a person who inspires others by the way I live my life and do my work um, did I have a person in my life who inspired me maybe a you know a teacher or a grandma or neighbor um, do I feel it's better to keep dreams small rather than risk disappointment uh, do I feel it's my job to keep expectations managed and this has certainly become a, um, something we're hearing a lot uh, from planners and, and support people. How comfortable am I with uncertainty? Um, or do I need guarantees? And coming from, so my background now is in the future studies area and there's a view that even the language of planning closes down the future for people um, rather than keeping it open. Do I believe the future is open to many possibilities and do I actually feel in charge of my own future? You know, do I feel a sense of self-determination and agency myself or do I not believe that's real or possible? So they're pretty big questions and I would, if, it, if people haven't sort of self-selected from those, those questions, then I'd get them to do some um, journaling questions along the lines of you process. I've just, I've got a set of questions that I've modified from um, the Presencing Institute. We might go into the next slide, Michaela. Um, so it's a, yeah, a, a list of, you know, it's a list of journaling questions that I think is helpful for people to go through before, um, before they actually start working with someone on putting together their, 
their, their plan for the future. Um, okay, so so the the main skill um, that we put time into developing and practicing is that of imagining and being able to generate positive mental images of the future we want to create. There's been a lot of this work done in the peace studies field um, in terms of creating world peace. Um, and that research tells us that the only way we can create the future that we want or a future other than what we've got now, um, whether it be a peaceful world or a decent life, is to generate images of it in our mind. Um, so this is probably the important skill to practice. And if we could, we'd be building it into a school curriculum. Um, and we'll just call that, call it imagining at the moment. So in terms of the process, um, we ask people to start imagining an individual that we know really well and create a picture of them in, the, in your mind with lots of detail, really focus on that image and imagine um, how they're feeling you know, add as much detail to that mental image as you can in terms of what they're doing, whether they're, you know, how they're feeling. Um, look around them, uh, who else is in the room or in the place with them. Actually imagine that person that you know well. So you might take grandma and imagine her at home in her favourite lounge chair um, and start to work through that then identify someone who you know but not so well maybe the young woman at the local shop or the bus driver who you see most days um, and generate uh, mental images now if people are struggling with that photographs can be very helpful um, or drawings but actually get them to um, practice imagining first of all people and then moving on to events and places um, and so you're starting off with a, a still and then you're progressing to a sequence of events. Make sure there's plenty of people, events, places. So this is all groundwork, if you like, in terms of imagining the future. Once, pe once you feel people are um, quite comfortable with that, then start to introduce perhaps some, uh, ne some more negative images. Um, Obviously, you're being very aware of people being triggered by unhappy uh, events or, or people, but um, starting to practice imagining, holding, and then letting go of those images so that people are able to not only generate an image, but let it go at will. So on to the next slide. Uh, the next section is, is really about dealing with uh, limiting beliefs. So you can frame this any way you like. Um, for some people, we frame it as, um, as the mental model. Um, we might be talking about the, an iceberg model where you've got your current reality as the tip of the iceberg and then you start to look underneath um, using systems theory, um, images and language, if people are familiar with that. But otherwise, I keep it to um, beliefs that are visible in the first instance. Um, and in talking about visible beliefs, uh, this is about knowing those beliefs that um, can either propel us forward or hold us back. Um, for those that hold us back, which is the ones we want to name and move through, it might be things like, you know, I haven't got enough money to do that. Um, I haven't got enough time. I don't know what my options are. Um, they're all limiting beliefs. They might be um, the next layer down, which is around things that I'm afraid of. So um, you know, might be fear of moving into um, em employment or open employment, um, fear, of, fear of being harmed, fear of failing, all of those things, um, some of which you can actually put a name to and others you can't. But they're right there in your face and they're limiting in terms of moving forward. The approach that we've taken is to do nothing with those beliefs other than just notice that they're there, accept them as reasonable and real and move on. And I guess the beliefs that, um, it's those beliefs that we don't see in ourselves as holding ourselves back 
are the ones that we want to pay a little more attention to. And it does seem that uh, this is when it starts to become really important to have people who you know and trust well around you, because often the people around you are the ones who see the contradictions. So, you know, as the parent, you might um, be gearing yourself up to support your 16 year old daughter to perhaps move into a share house in a few years. Um, but those around you may be able to um, see that in fact, there are some contradicting or hidden beliefs there that are gonna stand in the way of that. So on the one hand, the, the, the stated belief that the community is the answer, you know, a share house is gonna be a nice way, a nice uh, way to transition. Um, but underneath you actually see the community as danger and you're actually terrified about the prospect of um, harm. So in, in being able to create the future, shape the future that you want, and those beliefs that you have that are enabling and those, um, it's not necessary to deal with those or to process those necessarily in any way in this context other than to notice them. You might make a mental note or, or journal them, but move on. It's just important that you can see that because they can constrain your ability to shape your own future. I feel like I'm doing too much talking here, Michaela. I'm nearly <laughs> at the end. In fact, I'm going to um, yeah, that's great. just whiz through some of the tools that um, some of the approaches, just a few. So vision boards, we'll move on to the next slide. Yeah, I'll just whiz through these. I'm sure they're things you're quite familiar with, but um, vision boards, and even when I use other approaches, I still end up with a vision board often, um, or a little video of a pitch or whatever. Um, a timeline approach is what I used um, years ago uh, with a, I worked with a cartoonist um, so that the images um, went up onto the, the timeline really quickly um, and the participants were really quite captivated um, by the whole uh, illustration process. So that worked beautifully. And in that case, we had a, just a long piece of butcher paper as a timeline. Um, we started in the middle of the line and started to draw people, places, experiences, um, and then started to work backwards. We did it as a collective exercise, but it ended up, um, there were four women uh, at a time that were participating, and we were able to actually shape a story um, of past. We then got uh, the ladies to, uh, to cross out those experiences and people they didn't want to carry forward into the future mm -hmm. and to physically um, move those uh, pieces of paper up to the future as a, as a means. And it was surprisingly effective, you know, for people who, um, where their families had said, there's no way they can start to think about the future. I wouldn't even go there. Um, it was quite a successful process to use. The eulogy approach, which to be honest, I don't use very often, um, but it's if you take it just as another perspective, so rather than being present time and looking forward to start at the end of life, um, or you can start if, if the person has expressed um, a vision for the future and they're quite clear about it, start at that place, generate the, the mental image and then start to work backwards to now. That's a nice approach. The one that I love, and it's, I mean, as with everything, it, it's just, it, it's about what you become comfortable at and what you find people respond to. Um, and I'm quite passionate about a scenario sort of approach. It's something that, you know, the corporate world use every day in terms of thinking about and planning for the future. But I just boil it down to, um, what's life going to look like in five or 10 years if you do nothing different? And then think through, and you need to do this in a very, um, in a light touch way. What's the worst possible outcome? What's the worst possible life if you do nothing? And what's the, if you make, if you make the wrong decisions and then what's the best possible life you could create for yourself? What would that look like? And obviously spend more time on that one and then get people to start making some choices. Um, but again, it's about 
uh, supporting people to to grow a sense of agency um, and possibility and a sense that what they choose today, um, what they choose to do today is going to shape their future. And in particularly, I have found um, that uh, for people who are used to being done to, and something I haven't talked about at all is um, the experience, the life experience that many individuals and their families have, which is that they need to give up their sense of themselves and they need to find the mask that will work for them um, to get what they need out of the system. And when you spend a lifetime of working out whether you need to be a feisty mum, a compliant customer, a, you know, what is it that I need to play today to get um, what we need from the system, you, you do start to lose a sense of yourself. Um, and so finding yourself um, does become um, an important piece. And with that compromise, you lose any sense of agency um, and you're just waiting for people to tell you what you need, you know, what you, how you need to play it in order to, to get what you need and move forward. So I'm just thinking, let me just have a look. As you know, Michaela, I can talk all day. Yeah, that's all right. It would be good to get um, people into some conversation. Um, Let's do, leave. Do you have much more you wanted to add? No, I think we can we can finish it there. In terms of the shaping, you know, the next. If you turn to the next slide, sorry, yeah. So in terms of bringing dreams to life, you know, it is um, very much about taste testing, um, reflection, reimagining, being happy to let go of uh, things that you thought you wanted, um, but having experienced them you decide to let them go you know the the sense that there is no failure there is no letting people down um, a conversation I had with Meredith the other day um, where we need to be careful how we pitch dreaming a bigger life you know for those people at a different life stage where um, they are in survival mode or, or very much hanging on by a thread to being able to stay in their home, own home, that sort of thing. Certainly it needs to be um, approached a little differently and the language needs to be a little different, but um, no less about building capacity to dream um, and, and put some shape to that. So I guess my, my question for everyone is, is around um, if we're experiencing at the moment, as certainly I think we are in Australia, uh, watering down, um, and in some cases loss completely of choice and control and loss of dreaming and envisioning even from the language of the NDIS. Um, I think how do we keep, how do we, how do we start delivering on the promise of, of a good life? Awesome. Thanks, Valme. Um, Meredith, are you, are you good to keep going here? Um, you got on mute, darling. Sorry, yes, I'm just harvesting. There's been lots of great story gems I've just put up on the board. Um, thanks so much, Valme. That's fantastic. Um, okay, so shall we have our first breakaway? Is she able to help with that? Sorry, yes, breakout rooms are ready to go. Great, thank you. Okay, so we'll break out into rooms um, for our first series of World Cafe, and we'll talk about... Um, how do we bridge the build the bridge from serviced client to valued citizen? Thinking about what Val Mays just talked to us about. So we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, would anyone like to put some sticky notes on the first conversation goal that they may have missed out sharing verbally? Um, please go ahead and do that. If you'd like um, Michaela or myself to add it in for you, please just pop it into the chat. Okay, so we might um, jump into our second round of how do we build the bridge from service client to valued citizen if we had that magic wand and we could change whatever we wanted to, what would you do? So we'll have another 10 minute round. Well, welcome back everyone. How did we go? Did we have some good, robust discussions? We did. Great. 
I'll invite you to put your sticky notes on um, the mural board. Um, if you're not sure how to do that or you can't figure it out, please put your, your comments in the chat and Michaela and I will put them on the mural board for you. I'd, I'd love to hear some of the comments. Anyone has any? Like, what are some, what are some of the gold pieces that, um, that came up through your conversations? Um, oh, Michaela, okay. I was just telling everyone how I've recently come into NDIS, uh, like um, since it's originated, but I didn't have a lot of experience before and I've always had great care sports, as you would know. Um, but I've always, always had great care sports, so it's hard for me to imagine what life was like before. But one of the things that um, Val and Julie brought up was that the idea of not looking at at the amount of funding and how it's being used as the um, end goal, um, but rather to look at the, you know, the dreams and potential to move forward. And I thought that was really interesting to hear. It's Valme here, just quickly. Um, in, in our group, we had a couple of apologies for big, e big energy. <laughs> when, when in fact, you know, big energy, like, you know, never pull back because <laughs> Big energy is exactly the conditions where, you know, people can dream. Guess who that was, Michaela? <laughs> I, I was struck in our group when Jen mentioned um, the, her experience in the US, is it, Jen, of the, the medicalisation of things happening again. And I've noticed that that's happening here too um, in relation to the NDIS, the concept of dreaming and all that stuff oh that's very nice dear I think that's wonderful of you to do that can you just go to a psychologist and get a report that says um, that these things are valid you know there's a there's an undercurrent happening that I think we have to be aware of yeah the question that comes up for me when you talk about a medicalized model and what I was saying in our group as well too is so do you like where do you spend your energy? Do you spend your energy at a, at a personal level and say, um, that's fine, we've got this model that we, we work with and although it has rules and regulations, we'll just try and skirt around those or do you attack the bigger monster, which is the organisation and try and take on um, the fact that it is becoming a medicalised model and try and fight against that? My experience is that you get it, it's like absorbing your opposition. You know, you can persuade people by hook or by crook or nice ways to fight the bureaucracy for the rest of their lives, and they will do no dreaming and they will become shrunken images of their former self. Um, carrying the two, these two contradictory things around with you as a parent becomes so exhausting that you have to choose one in the end. And I'm choosing Edward's dreaming and we'll just deal with it as things come. Yeah. If I could that just share a, a comment from the previous group was, was about uh, you choose where you put your attention and what you have your attention on grows. So um, really the rightful place of the NDIS or any system as such is as admin, which is behind the scenes. So to rather than be bending over backwards to the system to sh shift our attention onto what we want um, and refuse to engage in that language. Um, and just to keep putting out there what we want in the language that is person-centered and human. Yeah, yeah, I agree that, mate. I said um, that if I had a magic wand and I could change things, I would put the power um, to change things within the NDIS in people with disabilities hands. They would be, um, they'd be running the system. They would have control of their own funding. They would choose when they want to change it, add to it, lessen it, and the language would change. So it wouldn't be about what are your goals? It would be, what are your dreams? Um, and for those that struggle with dreaming, what do you like? What do you want to try? What do you want to explore? You know, um, I think language is a huge barrier. So I'd get rid of all the suits and put people with a disability, their carers and families in the power. <laughs> yeah. And I think you have to question too, 
you know, having been a systems advocate for a long time, you can spend a lifetime advocating for changes in language and culture and so on. But it's actually much more compelling to have individuals en masse um, put their dreams, send their dreams and their own vision for the future in front of the system uh, rather than, you know, sit there and wait for it to come back to them. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, so before we finish up, we've just had to, Julie's just had to leave us, um, but we might just do a final checkout question just to finish off today's session. So how are you leaving today's session? We started off this morning with our check-in on your personal weather. You can relate it to weather if that, if you want to keep the theme going or if your, if your internal weather has changed, please share that with us. So how are you leaving today's session? Well, I'm perhaps feeling a little contemplative, but also it's afternoon on Tuesday for me. So I'm leaving on foot to my kitchen to get coffee. And I think we, I, I think we still have a lot of thinking to do about actually creating a bridge. Do we want a bridge? Do we want to implode what's going on and start fresh? Do you, you know, there's so much to just think about. Well, it, it, it's still pretty cold here. It's probably getting up to about nine or 10 degrees at the moment. It's early in the morning, about half past eight or 20 past eight. I'm feeling still um, in relation to um, building a bridge, still very tentative very concerned that this is going to come crashing and burning not not the least of which is that the NDIS has this cognitive dissonance within it that mm. is really bothering um, I'm going to have coffee too very shortly um, I've lost my thread sorry forgotten what I was going to say um, Edward's Edward's next planning meeting is on the 15th of October we haven't spent all our money because we've had 12 weeks absent from the community, basically, without support. Um, and they will likely cut his funding because we haven't spent it and we can't demonstrate how we will be able to spend it in the future. Um, so we're hoping to begin a goal of having Edward have his own art studio it's long term and it, it would be, it's just the thing that keeps me going in the middle of the night when you think, no, I can't do this anymore. I'm running away from home. Um, so we're still there, still doing our things, still dreaming a bit, but with the sort of Damocles holding, hanging over us. Yeah. Hey, if you, if you want to hang on after this session, I have a quick chat to you. There is a way out in this COVID pandemic time oh, excellent uh, thank you yes. <laughs> hang in there after this i'll have a chat with you yeah, yeah. yeah give you a strategy we're all using awesome mm -hmm. go mick <laughs> yeah. yeah thanks mick i think both yeah. cozy kate and i were going to put our hands up to <laughs> yeah. offer yeah, some yeah. support to kate too yeah, cool thanks um i'll pick Who up else would like um, to check out thanks yeah, um, um, I'm, I'm, I love dreaming, always have. Um, I am I on a very natural, very often um, dream five, ten years ahead. Um, and, um, yeah, and uh, this conversation has just made me go, ah, they keep doing that. I love it. Don't let anyone shut it down. <laughs> I've, got my, I've got my vision boards, all that stuff. So, yeah, I love it. Thanks, Belma. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I'll pick up the piece. It's funny because I was having a conversation just recently. Um, we, we're doing a few big life changes, we're moving house and things like that. And I have this way of going into things and not really worrying about how it's going to turn out because I just figure it'll turn out the way it turns out and then that will be okay. And um, that you just have to try things. You know, if you haven't tried it, you'll never know. And I guess that's my form of dreaming. And it's funny because I didn't actually expect anyone else to be thinking very much differently from that. Um, so this is just a recurring, it's funny how these conversations sort of recur and they become 
um, quite common in your day to day, um, or they do for me anyway. So, um, yeah, this is like an extension of what's happening in life, and I'm, it's a it's a very enjoyable place to be. So, thanks everyone. It was fun. Thanks, Kate. I'm still sort of amazed at how the um, you know we don't have the same initials, right? We have Medicaid. You guys have NDIS, and it's still the same. You know, in the states, it's still you know different initials, but the same sort of problems. And um, I wish we could spend so you guys are the conversations were so deep and, and thoughtful and i really wish we could just spend some more time talking about it because i think i think th this is this is the solution yes. it's calling it out naming it um and language is so so important i i really i agree and i almost feel like instead of when we when we get into these you know planning sessions, right? Um, those aren't dreams, right? Those are check boxes, right? Yeah. So don't call them dreams, call them check boxes, right? Don't, don't sit there with a clipboard and ask me about my dream, right? Mm. And, and translate that into an outcome or a goal, right? Have dreams and then have outcomes and goals, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I know that sound may sound counter, but that's what I came away from tonight is like, we have to stop calling you know, we have to stop calling, we have to start calling them what they are, right? If they're, if they're government outcomes or their government goals, then let's call them that and, and figure out the dreams and then figure out, let, let's make the system work for us and make the system work for our, the people that we support and we love. And instead of, you know, having, like Kate was saying, um, that idea of, of, lowering you know i don't know there's just a lot i'm sorry i just lost i just i, I value this conversation tremendously it, it really um again i wish we could spend i learned a lot and i wish we could spend a lot more time talking about this because this is this is what we need to do this is what we exactly what we need to do so thank you yeah i think just to add on to jen's point um there is a sanctity of dreams and um, of having dreams as preserved as dreams um, and I think, yeah, it's important to not confuse, like, um, as Jen said, like government checkboxes um, to convert all your dreams into government checkboxes because dreams in and of themselves are something, you know, spiritual food for the soul. And I think they're important for that reason. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks, Daniel. So while you're talking, do you want to do your little checkout, Daniel? How are you leaving us today? Oh, um, sorry, so I'm a bit confused. Is it, are, are we actually meant to report on the weather? Like what the weather's like here? Because it's pretty sunny. No. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Daniel, you, I should explain. You came in a little bit late. So when we started this session, we had a check-in question. And the check-in question was, how is your internal weather feeling? Like, how are you feeling today? Are you feeling a bit cloudy, a bit stormy, a bit sunny? And so the checkout question is how are you leaving today's session and i invited people to continue with the weather theme if that's what they wanted to do does that make sense yeah sorry yeah. My, my my apologies no, um, no that's okay yeah so i feel and uh, i felt like same as last week every time i leave these meetings i feel like in a sense of optimism for the future um and that's continuing having spoken to everyone here um so I guess optimistic would be a word I would use. Beautiful. Thanks, Daniel. So I'll pick up, I'll pick up the piece. Um, I am leaving with um, uh, just a reminder uh, about not apologizing for having big energy and a reminder of how compelling it becomes when that energy becomes collective you know, when everybody has the same energy for dreaming and making sure that that's the reference point, not the system by whatever name it is. Um, but what I'm going to be having in my head all day is Daniel's comment in the chat about what would Stella Young be doing? Yeah. <laughs> what would Stella say? Because that's yeah. brilliant. Mm. Thanks, yeah. everyone. It's been, a, it's been good to be back in this type of work. Beautiful.
thanks so much. Well, I'm going to check out and I'm leaving motivated um, to keeping the dream alive and supporting others to keep their dream alive. Um, and these conversations really inspire and motivate me. So thank you so much for all your sharing. And um, has anyone else need to check out or are we all checked out? I think we're all checked out. So remember, we've still got some more of these sessions to go. We've got another few sessions lined up, uh, four sessions, three sessions. So I invite you to continue this journey with us if you'd like to. Um, it's been a privilege and an honor to, to be in the room with you and to share all, all and hear all of your collective wisdom. So thank you so much and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Now. Bye.